Our homes provide us with comfort unlike anything else. It's where we retreat to after a long day. It's where we yearn to be by the end of a vacation or business trip. We personalize it, make it our own. It's a familiar space where we find privacy from the outside world. But have you ever considered what it might be like to never leave your home? To be unable or unwilling to walk out your front door? I'm Stephanie Cohen, and this is Within These Walls. Over the next half hour, we'll meet several individuals who can't or don't leave their homes for a variety of reasons. We'll see how both the body and mind can play a role in rendering a person homebound. We'll also hear from the people and organizations who pay special attention to homebound populations. Along the way, we'll explore the relationship between ourselves and our homes and how it may change when leaving just isn't an option. According to a Gallup poll, 9 out of 10 Americans would prefer to be cared for at home if they knew they were terminally ill. The first story we're going to hear is about a woman who works to make that a reality. She developed a training program for end-of-life doulas, holistic, non-medical professionals who work with terminally ill patients to make their death a more peaceful and less stressful experience. Suzanne O'Brien wants to change the way Americans think about death. She's a registered nurse who worked for years in hospice and cancer care. And what she saw there made her realize that something needed to change. When I was in the hospital working in cancer, and I would have older people, the sweetest people you can ever meet, you know, saying to me, I just want to go home. And then I thought, well, why aren't you? When you don't feel well, where do you want to be? You want to be in your surroundings with your, with your pets, with your TV, with comfortable things around you, maybe pictures of family. Everyone wants to be home. O'Brien says while hospitals are great for getting better, she doesn't think they're the right place for someone at the end of their lives. You know, there's so much noise, there's so much beeping, you know, people don't get rest there. And so to have an end-of-life process in an environment that is so sterile and just noisy and and unfamiliar is probably the complete opposite of what most people's goals are. But home care is easier said than done. Leaving hospitals and hospices means leaving around-the-clock care. She says this can cause all sorts of stress for the families. Death is the second leading fear in this country, the second leading fear. People have not seen death. They don't know how to care for someone. They're petrified to put The responsibility on them to care for their loved one at the end-of-life process in the home is so unfair to me without proper support. Over and over again, O'Brien says she saw this terrible dilemma of terminally ill patients desperately wanting to be home, but the people close to them feeling like they'd be inadequate caretakers. On top of that, not everyone has the option of being cared for by loved ones. Pew Research Center shows 20% of baby boomers never had children. Other factors like distance, estrangement, and finances can also make it difficult to depend on a loved one to be willing and able to do home care. So though a terminally ill person might really want to stay in their home environment, the question becomes, who will take care of them? O'Brien felt like death had become a more stressful, painful process than it needed to be, but she just wasn't sure what could be done about it. Then, in 2012, she went to Zimbabwe to volunteer with Africa Hospice, While there, she saw a totally different approach to end of life. They didn't have the medications to match the need. They don't have equipment. But they were training a neighbor to sit in the hut with the neighbor who was dying and their family for the duration like a birthing doula. And the power of your presence, being with somebody and holding the space for them as they were having an end of life process and taking care of their family was absolutely everything. She says witnessing this helped her realize what was missing from the end-of-life process in the United States. What we're not doing in America is being present. So what we do have is medication, we do have the equipment, but we're running in and out with our computers and documenting the whole time on a visit for an hour. It's inexcusable, and it's not going well. Armed with this new perspective, O'Brien says she decided she had to do something to help the situation back home. She felt if we could just incorporate presence into the death process, it would make it more positive and comfortable for everyone involved. When she came back to the States, she immediately started developing a training program for what she called end-of-life doulas. When you think of a doula, you probably picture a birthing doula. They're professionals who support expecting parents throughout the process of giving birth. 
Their goal is to make it a peaceful and empowering experience. O'Brien wanted to train people to do something very similar for those who were dying. An end-of-life doula's responsibilities can change from patient to patient. Ideally, they'll start working with the patient when they first receive their terminal diagnosis. They build trust and provide emotional support and companionship. They're able to observe how the patient is feeling and help manage their pain since they often stay by their side for long stretches. They're trained in symptom management and can advise when medical attention may be needed. They might do important planning, like funeral and burial arrangements. But above all, having a doula means terminally ill people can have a positive end-of-life process in the comfort of their own home. A doula and a visiting hospice nurse are not synonymous. Besides the fact a nurse is medically trained, whereas a doula isn't necessarily, they play different roles. While a hospice nurse can provide the important medical training and equipment that a doula cannot, a doula offers other unique benefits. As a former hospice nurse and current doula, O'Brien explains the difference. As a hospice nurse, I'm only allowed to be there for one hour on a visit, sometimes once a week if my patient is stable. The doula, not having those kind of restrictions, can be there for the duration. You're there holding the space and guiding the whole time with that family, which is amazing and, and what they need. O'Brien says about a third of end-of-life doulas are medically trained like herself. So that means many aren't, and they don't need to be. She explains their training centers around the non-medical aspects of end-of-life, like addressing emotional pain and being present. As O'Brien said earlier, the process of death and the unknowns that come with it can be terrifying for loved ones. They can be on edge with heightened emotions and deep anxiety. Knowing this, O'Brien incorporated caring for the loved ones into her doula training. The doula takes care of not only the patient, but all the loved ones. And you will have people who are completely like uncomfortable and stressed, and we want to work with them because that's unfair that they're in that, that vibration. One of the things that hospice patients will tell me is that one of their biggest issues is that they feel like they're being a burden to their family. And I thought this needs to be dealt with as well, and the training does that. If we can train families ahead of time so that they're not as petrified, then the patient won't pick that up. It helps everybody. And then if doulas can come in, it takes the weight and the stress off of the family. Because you don't want an end-of-life patient to feel guilty. O'Brien explains that by paying attention to the loved ones, doulas can bring a level of stability to the home environment. She says this is key to a positive end-of-life process. The stabilization phase is where the magic happens, what I call the magic. So if you can get somebody grounded and stable, meaning they've gotten some rest, their pain, their nausea is under control, maybe the house is a little tidied up, they might not be able to physically like go walking or doing a lot of things, but they can do conversation and they, and they can do reflection and they can have a philosophy of maybe wanting to ask, because a lot of times patients will ask, hey, what is this like? You know, what can I expect? O'Brien says though it's hard to accept, eventually death is certain. I think that we also have to remember that end of life is a natural part of the life's journey. It's okay that people die. It's not okay that they don't die well. But she firmly believes that with the guidance of an end of life doula, the process can become less painful and instead be remembered as a peaceful and beautiful transition. Our next story is about an organization in New York City that makes it possible for chronically ill people to stay home by bringing home-cooked food right to their door, free of charge. It's easy to take for granted being able to grocery shop and cook, but there's a lot that goes into it. You have to get out of the house, carry heavy bags, and stand for long periods of time to prep and clean up. When someone's sick, this everyday process becomes even more challenging. So for many chronically ill people, eating nutritious and filling meals isn't always realistic. Take Craig Palmer, for example. He's 80 years old and has lived in the same 4-4 walk-up in Manhattan for nearly 60 years. Craig lives with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which really physically limits him. I can't get out of bed, so I haven't been out probably four years. With his condition, making his own meals is out of the question for Craig. He loves his apartment and doesn't want to leave behind all the memories he's made there. But if you can't get food on the table, it becomes a lot harder to stay home. 
This is where the New York City-based nonprofit God's Love We Deliver comes in. Every weekday, their volunteers and chefs make over 7,000 meals to deliver to the doors of clients like Craig, who are too sick to shop and cook for themselves. Their work started over 30 years ago, delivering home-cooked meals to a handful of people with HIV and AIDS. Now, they serve clients with hundreds of unique illnesses. While God's Love delivers to people who are not necessarily homebound, they say that population still makes up a large part of their client base. For Craig Palmer, the combination of God's love and his 24-7 health aids make it so he can stay right where he wants to be, in his home. I would not go to a, to a home. I'm, I'm in one here. This is the Palmer home. God's Love Vice President and Chief Development Officer David Ludwigson says this desire to stay home is not out of the ordinary. I think naturally anybody would rather be in their home than, than in a hospital or, or a nursing facility. You need to be there to get better, but it's not a place that's set up for wellness. You, you want to have your hospital stay be as short as possible. I need my groceries for food. That's Simone Stewart, a God's Love volunteer who's delivered meals to Milagros Rios for two years now. Milagros is 80 years old and lives alone in a second-story walk-up in Manhattan. Her health issues like congestive heart failure, chronic fatigue, and fibromyalgia have made the task of standing long enough to cook basically impossible. These health issues have also taken an emotional toll on her. She isn't able to get out much anymore and says she's struggled with depression. But when God's love started delivering her homemade meals, Milagros says things became easier and her outlook changed. I felt remembered. I didn't feel alone. Sometimes I still feel alone, but... Uh... You know, that was a tough time for me, that time before God's Love We Deliver. So. God's Love We Deliver relies on over 10,000 yearly volunteers to keep things running smoothly. They chop hundreds of pounds of produce, carefully package individual meals, scrub baking sheets, and go out on deliveries to clients' homes. David Ludwigson says the door-to-door -door delivery is key to their organization. When you deliver a meal, we always say you're delivering more than food. You're delivering hope. You're delivering health. You're delivering love and dignity. And with over 20 million meals delivered since the organization began, God's Love continues to deliver a lot more than just food. While a food delivery service can help people stay in their homes, you have to wonder what good it is if they can't chew that food. Dr. Alyssa Kaufman is a dentist who for nearly 20 years has done home visits for people who can't visit a dentist's office. Reporter Natalie Migliori has this story. Hi. Hi, I'm Dr. Kaufman. They told you I was coming, right? Hey, nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. Dr. Alyssa Kaufman is paying a house call to John and Caroline an elderly couple who live on Central Park West in Manhattan. Their caretakers, Zayara and Sheila, greet her at the door. They walk Dr. Kaufman through an aging apartment and lead the way to John and Caroline. John is 88 and struggles to talk. Caroline is 86 and is completely nonverbal now. Kaufman introduces herself to the couple and explains she's there to clean their teeth. She starts by opening her bag, pulling out some tools, and putting on some gloves. This is all I'm going to do. I'm going to open your mouth, and I'm going to look inside, and I'm going to see if there's anything that might be bothering you. So I'm just going to touch your teeth. How's that sound? You don't mind, right? No. Okay. Turn to me. Kaufman cleans John's teeth for about 25 minutes. She asks John if he feels any pain while she makes her way from one side of his mouth to the other. When she's finished, she begins to work on Caroline. Caretaker Zayara and Sheila already explained Caroline has gaps between her back teeth, making it hard to chew all her food. And that's the huge gap. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. You can't be oh, oh, my God. That's yes. a sin. Kaufman spends time cleaning each of Caroline's teeth. She says Caroline's gums are inflamed and her teeth need to be brushed more regularly. But it's hard because Caroline can't open her mouth by herself. Kaufman shows caretakers Zayara and Sheila how they should be brushing Caroline's teeth. She even gives them a special toothbrush to practice on themselves. 
Kaufman says most of her patients are like John and Caroline, who can't leave their home because of physical limitations. Probably 80% of my practice has dementia, and I've calculated that the average age of my patient is 90. Last week I had a 106-year-old woman with every marble, could walk, could talk, and she even wrote me a check. I've never seen that in my life. Kaufman says she started making house calls right out of college when her friend's father had a stroke and couldn't leave the house. She says one patient turned into another until eventually she sold her practice and started making house calls full-time in 2000. She says she wants her patients to hold on to their quality of life for as long as possible. I try to always make sure that my patients know that I'm there to help them. That's number one. But what they really look forward to in life is I think eating. So if you can't chew your food, then what do you have to live for? I make sure that my patients are able to maintain their dignity and have their teeth as long as possible. Kaufman says she tries to have fun with her patients while also giving them the respect they deserve. Even when I know they don't really appreciate what I'm doing, I try to make it fun for them, whether it's to give them something to hold on to or I just treat people the way I would want my parents to be treated. I like to have them feel that someone cares about them, and, and I want to have fun at the same time. If I didn't like what I was doing, it would be a pretty awful job. Kaufman says she's surprised there aren't more dentists who are making house calls. She also teaches dentistry, and she hopes to inspire her students to follow in her footsteps. I'm Natalie Migliori. In our next story, we hear from someone who was not homebound due to physical limitations, but because he was bound by his thoughts. Some two decades ago, Neil Seidman struggled with agoraphobia and panic disorder. Things got so bad that for several years, he was essentially unable to leave his home. Neil lives in California, so I talked with him on the phone about his experience with agoraphobia and how it affected his life. Hello. Hi, Neil. Can you hear me? Ah, I can hear you now. Oh, awesome. Uh, how does the audio sound on your end? It sounds good to me. Great. So to start, talk about the beginning of your experience with agoraphobia and where it all began for you and when. Yeah, so it started for me back in the 1990s, and I was going through a very stressful period. My best friend was very ill and dying and I was not dealing with the emotions. I was starting a new business, working 14, 16 hour days, going into debt, just a tremendous amount of stress. And then at the same time, I decided, well, I'll do a heavy duty workout routine at the gym. So this combination of big life stresses and then the physical stresses of really kind of overtraining uh, at the gym triggered my first panic experience. And it was absolutely terrifying because I had no idea what was going on. I was at the gym doing a heavy workout. All of a sudden, I felt dizzy, lightheaded. My heart was pounding. I thought, what's wrong with me? So I got myself home, and I saw my doctor the very next day and gave me an EKG and said, Neil, everything's fine, and it's just stress. So I felt reassured and felt okay until about a week later, I had another panic attack. And that's how it started for me, uh, was having one panic attack after another. And they were just, they were the worst experiences I've ever had. Nothing else even comes to be a close second. For someone who is listening, who hasn't experienced a panic attack, I'm wondering if you can sort of describe what it is like. Think of an experience that you had of the highest anxiety you can think of. I say, got that in your mind? Okay. Multiply that by 100. That's a panic attack. <laughs> so it's similar to high anxiety, except that it's just completely overwhelming in its intensity. And any symptoms in general? Heart pounding, feeling lightheaded, which is because we're over-breathing, tingling, numbness, Chest pain is a very common one, which comes from muscle tension. And then at the same time, very, very terrifying, scary thoughts. I feel lightheaded. I must be about to faint. My heart is pounding. I'm about to have a heart attack. And I was having those scary thoughts really 
intensely all at the same time. So that's called panic disorder. Then agoraphobia is really kind of a sister condition to panic disorder. So what agoraphobia is, I'm trying to manage my anxiety and panic. And so I start restricting my activities to try to have less triggers for panic. So I'll give you an example uh, of what happened for me. I got agoraphobia very, very quickly. So I was on a freeway that I'd been many, many, many times. And on the freeway, I had a panic attack which was this just incredibly awful experience. So when I got home, I decided, well, I'll never go back on that freeway again. And then a couple days later, I had a near panic on another freeway. So I thought, well, I'm not going on any freeway now. So that pattern of avoidance is called agoraphobia, and it creeps up on you. And it helps you maybe manage on that particular day to avoid the activity. But it doesn't solve anything. In fact, it creates more problems because the panic wasn't located on the freeway. It was located in me. So I kept withdrawing from activities to try to have less panic, but I still kept getting triggered. And I got more and more and more restricted. And at my low point, I was so restricted. I could be in my apartment and I was having panic attacks even while in the apartment. And then I could go one short block if I ran there and immediately came right back. What was it like for you to actually be confined to your home for the most part? For me, feelings of failure. Why wasn't I able to do the things that everybody else could do? So low self-esteem, feelings of isolation. My whole day was devoted to just managing the anxiety and panic. So it wasn't just the physical restriction of being in the apartment all day. It was the life restriction of this is what my life is about, just managing with this distress and trying to get through the day every day. Are there any specific moments you recall where you just felt hopeless? Yeah, it, it, it was the lowest point of my life. I was so discouraged for almost three years. I had been really doing my best to get better. That was up to three times a week seeing the therapist. At my low point, I couldn't even get to his office anymore. I was taking the medication that the psychiatrist was prescribing, and it did help me manage. But in spite of that, I got worse and worse. Now, looking back, It was actually a blessing for me because feeling that low got me to change what I was doing. And the first thing that I did differently is I started to do some prayer, which I hadn't done for a long, long time. And then the next thing was I finally got really, really angry and I fired my therapist. I had no idea what I was going to do, but my desperation in spite of my panic, got me to open up to new resources. And that's how I started my recovery, because I started finding some good help. You got involved in cognitive behavioral therapy, right? Right, right. So the first thing, now I had never heard of cognitive behavioral therapy. So I found a wonderful meditation teacher. She traveled to my apartment and did sessions with me and helped me connect with a place of inner safety. And that really helped me profoundly. But I still was extremely limited. And I knew that if I traveled any distance from home, the panic could be right there again. I found out about this wonderful organization, which is called the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. They had at the time, they would snail mail a list of local therapists that specialized with anxiety disorder. And that's how I found out about cognitive behavioral therapy. I was doing interviews on the phone with these therapists. And I found a wonderful cognitive behavioral therapist. And I could just tell from the first conversation, this is somebody that can be a wonderful teacher for me. It can help me recover. But his office was 15 miles away, which at the time would be like asking me to go to the moon. So I said to him, you know, I want you to be my therapist, 
but there's no way I can get to your office. And without missing a beat, he comes right back and he says, Neil, that's no problem. That's how I start with most clients on the phone. And the phone sessions work great. And that's how I start, really started overcoming the agoraphobia with the tools that he taught me. What do you wish that people understood better about agoraphobia? When we have this condition, we just we do our best to manage. For most people with agoraphobia, they're not staying home because they want to. They desperately want to have a normal life. And they feel like a failure because they can't. That's something that we can have some empathy for. So now it's been almost 20 years That's right. since you started finding real relief. You said now you have a passion for travel. Right. So for most people with agoraphobia, taking a plane trip is the most challenging activity. And that was definitely uh, the most challenging for me. And it took me a long time, but I accomplished freedom with driving. And I got to the point where I actually drove across country and loved it. But I still hadn't flown on a plane. So my very first plane ride, I found the shortest flight I could get. It was very challenging, but it also turned out to be an amazing, exhilarating experience. And then I decided, well, let's really have some fun. So I flew to Alaska. And as part of the trip, I included a train ride, a boat ride, river rafting, so all different kinds of transportation. When we overcome this condition and we're able to do things we haven't been able to do, for me, I just experienced such a profound feeling of joy and gratitude. When I take a plane trip now, I remember that. And I just kind of smiled to myself and said, wow, this is just an amazing experience to be able to travel and to be able to meet any challenge that might come my way in terms of anxiety or panic and to be able to feel safe in a location far from home and a place that I've never been. It's just an amazing experience. Even today, after all these years, I just love traveling. I'm sure, especially when there may have been a time where you never thought it would be possible. That's for sure. Now that Neil has recovered, he's an anxiety coach and teacher. In sharing his story, he hopes to convince those struggling that recovery is possible. Many people who are homebound may experience a lost connection with their spirituality or religion. This can be especially hard on people who are aging or sick. Our last story comes from a pastor who believes that doesn't need to be sacrificed, so he administers communion to members of his parish who can't get to church anymore. My name is Father Raphael Eze, and I am the pastor here at uh, St. Bartholomew's Church, Yonkers. We take communion to those who are sick, those who are homebound, we try to go at least uh, once a month or maybe twice a month. And then we have Eucharistic ministers who bring communion to them more often. Some of them are people who come to church every Sunday. They understand what the communion is. It's the body of Christ. It's part of their spiritual life. It's part of their spiritual nourishment. So you try to continue that for them. But also you try to let them know that that's the members of the parish, even though they're not able to, to come out. Some of them live alone, and sometimes their families kind of don't visit that often. Sometimes they just want to talk, you know, so they just start talking and just listen to them. We still try to help them to know that we think of them, we're praying for them. That's the part of the community. We've not forgotten them, um, but also bringing them comfort. You know, the, the comfort that is coming from, from Christ. And um, beyond all that is the fact of the sacrament. It's the body of Christ. And that's the way that Jesus promised to, to be with us. Within These Walls is a production of WFUV News. It was written and produced by me, Stephanie Cohen, with help from Natalie Migliori, and edited by George Bodarkey. You can find an archive of this and other WFEV specials on WFEVnews.org. Thanks for listening.